me well? Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Ana Iris Garrido, um, and I'm uh, one of the presenters tonight. Um, I'm a PhD candidate in Women and Gender Studies at Rutgers University, uh, and I'm also a member of PLAC's uh, the Center of Lesbian and Gay Studies of the City University of New York. Um, if you're not familiar with PLAC's, membership organization that um, provides a space for different activities such as lectures, um, seminars as the one that we have tonight. Uh, it also has a fellowship program and um, the international resource networks that is one of the sponsors um, for the talk tonight. And that's um, a group of scholars from different parts of the world connect with one another uh, and who work on different issues related to gender and sexuality. Uh, so uh, I don't know if uh, any of you are members of class. Are any of you members of class? Very good. Uh, I'm asking the question because if you are not, I would like to encourage you to become a member of class um, because it provides a space for uh, lectures on gender and sexuality and gay and lesbian studies. Um, and if you're aware of the amount of spaces that there are um, for this, they're not that, that common in academia, activism, um, the artist world. So uh, I encourage you to um, uh, go to the class webpage and um, look uh, for the possibilities of becoming a member uh, to support this organization. Cafe, 
it also emerges as a deeply class space. So in this sense, not only sexual practices or identities grant permission to form part of the identity, but also economic resources. Um, so what is El Ambiente? I'm saying Ambiente, Ambiente. Um, now we're going to look a little bit more in detail about what it does. Um, so in Spanish, the term Ambiente might literally be translated as environment, atmosphere, or milieu. Uh, in the works of Latina, Latino and Latin American sexuality, El Ambiente is more specifically a queer environment, uh, atmosphere, or milieu. Alaska um, has suggested that to be in El Ambiente means the occupation of a space of queer possibility. Um, this particular space, as literary critic Richard Ellis says, stands in contrast with Anglo-American gay and lesbian spaces that are largely based on sharing an identity. El Ambiente has always lived as a collective experience. In the sexual identity narrative, one can identify as gay or lesbian without being part of any community. Situating El Ambiente in the context of late 20th century Mexican West Coast, sociologist Lionel Cantu has referred to El Ambiente as a homosexual subject. Cantu is principally interested in how gay tourism affects Mexican sexualities. He highlights how el ambiente is embedded in processes of globalization. While the article focuses on the Mexican West Coast, processes of urbanization, communication, and the rise of gay and lesbian movements, which gave rise to el ambiente, could also explain how it emerged in the capital. Um, other authors who have written on Mexico mention the term ambiente writings without giving it a central importance. Uh, Murray and Dines describe the ambiente as a homosexual dominant, so uh, a world. Similarly, in reference to Gonzalez Rodriguez, uh, Carrillo describes it as a code to refer to the world of male same-sex desire. In her ethnography on lesbian feminist groups in Mexico City, Alfarache Lorenzo speaks of Lugar de Ambiente, uh, which means gay and lesbian bars and clubs. Camille reports that during field work, ambiente was a word used by men to refer discreetly to a third person as practicing sex and uh, So, as you see, there's like different ideas on what el ambiente consists uh, in the writings, and I have to say that usually it's included as a footnote uh, in the text of these authors, or it's uh, mentioned on page 12 that is two or three lines. Um, at the exception of Richmond Ellis, uh, the notion of El Ambiente has not really been theorized in them. Um, so um, these ideas would be regrouped in three different um, frameworks. So the first one would be the idea of the Ambiente as a space, so it would be imaginary or uh, specific such as bars and clubs. Um, it has also been talked about as a subculture. And it has uh, been talked about also as a discrete mode of identification, so a, a discrete mode of identification, so a, a way of identifying someone else. So is he the ambiente? Oh, yes, but the approximate translation might be he is he free. Um, so during an ambiente, um, uh, during field work, when I was doing field work, an ambiente was generally referred to as a circuit of clubs and bars, but was also spoken of as any queer space, such as women's cafes or discussion groups organized by lesbian organizations. Um, El Ambiente was also often used in relation to virtual spaces that are not contained between four walls, such as soccer leagues, uh, in which a large amount of lesbians participated. Uh, in this case, are all others um, that tend to focus uh, on particular places, and it is important to remark that what produces the ambiente is its participants. So, the ambiente only exists in the hands of women and men who make it happen. A bar is a bar. What makes it primarily a bar of the ambiente is the infinite set of relations, be it sexual, affective, ideological, or material, that take place between participants. In, between participants. Uh, while the lack of resources, discrimination, difficulties 
to reach out to Chenderan might preclude participants from producing the ambiente they wish to. Individuals inscribed in a particular historical, cultural, and economic context are at the center of the ambiente. Some of the nodes of the network are highly visible through the spaces produced by the network, where individuals congregate for politically, uh, or political organizations that come to form part of public life. Other nodes of the ambiente remain spontaneous, temporary, almost imperceptible, private. The politics, goals, and reasons for producing an ambiente are varied. Uh, in the course of a trip to Mexico City in 1998, the first time I came in contact, um, the first time I came in contact with to denote individuals practicing same-sex sexuality was ser de ambiente, to be of the ambiente. To be the ambiente is not necessarily associated with a particular identity, only with gender and sexualities that defy traditional notions. In the course of fieldwork, I observed the word to be known mostly by people who were in contact with El Ambiente. Paola, an informant, recalled her first experience at Pride Parade in Mexico City, where she saw a schoolmate who introduced her to the term uh, de Ambiente, she recalls. He asked me, what are you doing here? Uh, are you de Ambiente? I did not know what that word meant, but I answered, I am with a woman, so he answered, oh, so you are. So we walk together. Uh, in very categorized de ambiente, Paula introduced to them, Paula is introduced to the ambiente. One has to question about the ways in which Paula would have been introduced to these networks if she had not been the ambiente. She was already walking in the parade in any way, in a temporary space of the ambiente. And would have Paula been inserted in the networks of the ambiente in the same way if she was a man? Scholars who have brought to our attention El Ambiente have tended to focus on the experience of men. While it is true that same-sex circuits of sexual, symbolic, or material exchange characterize El Ambiente, and that many spaces are exclusively addressed to men, there also exists a portion of El Ambiente in which only women participate. Participants of all genders also take part in other ramifications of the Ambiente. The circuits of exchange threaded between multiple bodies and souls in the ambiente are often more complex than the imagined male same sex circuits. Stories of friendship between men and women in El Ambiente abound. The presumably heterosexual couple that met in El Ambiente. Trans lesbian women who dance with men and women but only flirt with the ladies. Mothers that come for a drink with their son form all part of the urban gossip of Mexico City ambiente. But the fact that the ambiente is truly queer, and not only based on same-sex sexual encounters, does not mean that all social positionalities are erased, and that being a man, a woman, a transgender, etc., makes no difference. There are situated knowledges in the ambiente, different perspectives, uh, perspectives, hierarchies, gestures of inclusion and exclusion in different branches of the ambiente. I would like to examine now the possibilities that young women have to insert themselves in these circuits of camaraderie, pleasure, and influence. Um, El Ambiente was uh, consistently labeled in interviews as a space of friendship and support for women. On its negative side, El Ambiente was characterized as a space of rivalry and jealousy. Uh, as Zia phrased it, I don't like the Ambiente. You arrive with your woman, and the people at the next table are already flirting with her. Zia, in fact, preferred to have dates out of the ambiente. Andrea also disliked the ambiente because there was too much, um, and I quote, drinking and smoking in her opinion. She nonetheless labeled it as well as a space of support, where you learn how to defend yourself, how to learn to say the things you feel and build self-esteem. Interviews suggested that it was difficult to make it to the ambiente in the first place because of the relative invisibility of female same sex sexuality and the lack of dissemination of spaces that exist for them. Uh, despite the fact that a lesbian movement distinct from the gay and feminist movement has been active in Mexico since the late 1970s, male same sex sexuality predominated in social imaginaries. Uh, women's economic status also explains in part difficulties participate in commodified spaces of the ambiente. Since the 
the 1980s, Mexico's economy has undergone profound transformations. Uh, in a climate of, and I quote, recurring recessions, policy measures that include fiscal reforms, privatization or state reforms, labor market flexibilization, and free trade agreements have been applied to incorporate Mexico into the global, global economy. And I quote Parado and Sinti. In this context of structural adjustments policies, women's workers' conditions have also um, worsened, uh, says Alarcón González and Miki. In 2005, according to INEFI, women of lower social economic status in the federal district earn wages of about 10% less than men. Um, the trend identified as wages increase. In higher socioeconomic groups, women earn about 29% less than men. Due to women's lower wages, it is not surprising that women own the most visible spaces in the ambient they correspond to less commodified spaces, such as lesbian organizations and support groups, um, or more affordable places such as lesbian cafes. Nonetheless, the possibility of having access to resources for producing the ambiente is not the only factor that plays into young women's possibility to participate in the ambiente. In addition to economic possibilities, the relative invisibility of the category lesbian and the lack of dissemination of spaces that exist for women, mobility also often limits young women to visit the ambiente. Most women I interviewed live at home, so that's 16 out of 22, uh, with their natal family. This was not only particular to women of the ambiente, as the economic situation has been deteriorating over the past decades. Families have elaborated several strategies of survival. Tweedam suggests that they have, uh, these have included having fewer children, but also often keeping different generations under the same roof. Nonetheless, even in cases where they could afford renting an apartment, moving out of home prior to marriage, was described by my friends Juliana and Gabriela as very liberal. Um, living with the family often meant complying with a code of conduct. As Zia phrased, the popular perception is, and I quote, good girls go to school and then they go home. Then they always get there before 10 p.m. Zia, who did not care about these notions, was perceived negatively by her neighbors in Estado de Mexico. Um, and she says, uh, I'm the neighborhood loca. The neighborhood crazy woman. Even if young women's mobility around the city was often limited, the fact that most of them were expected to go to school and to work opened different possibilities. Salazar Cruz, who studied how working class women in Mexico City managed this, their space out of their house, uh, points out that daughters are more mobile than women at the head of household, who in turn travel more than wives who generally work near the residence. This situation gives women more in turn travel more than wives who generally work near the residence site. This situation gives women more independence, including within the field of their sexuality. Um, so uh, I have found that the ambiente in Mexico City is often oriented towards the middle classes, as in other parts of the world. In this final section, I'm here interested in examining how the ambiente is reproduced as a space mostly oriented towards the middle class. I suggest that two dynamics are at play. The exclusion to the process of commodification of the ambiente and the systematic discrimination of working class individuals that, it, that is often played in affective relationships, meaning friendship and love. While individuals of diverse genders, class, nationalities, and ethnicities might participate in the ambiente, often the ambiente fails to fulfill the promise that sexual dissidents will find home in the ambiente. It is not uncommon that class supersedes sexual identity, intimacy, or practice in terms of how alliances between individuals are formed. In 2000, one of the most popular places among the women I interviewed was a club called Anyway. The first floor of this club that was free was always packed with men and women having drinks, chatting, and playing pool. However, the second and the third floor cost 70 pesos, and at the time it was approximately 7 US dollars to access. Uh, this price constituted more than a day of earnings for people working at minimum wage, and an important portion of the earnings of 
one day of work at average wage for a young woman in the federal district, about 17 US dollars. Aside from the occasional visit to it, young women who cannot afford the price of clubs met more often at lesbian cafes or organizations where they could spend less money or hang out for people, in the case of organizations. In this sense, spaces of the ambiente in which women participate were also stratified in terms of trust. Nonetheless, even in the case of the lesbian cafe where a cup of regular coffee costs at least 10 pesos, it remained expensive for a young woman working for one or two minimum wages or that earns more, but you must contribute to expenses at home. It is therefore not surprising that most interviewees identified as middle class or from the lower middle class. Economic resources dictate the spaces to which women of the ambient in Mexico City have access to. However, I have found that not only money, but also classes attitudes limit the participation of women in networks of the ambient. On one occasion, I invited Carla, a public relations executive, to join me in Zia for coffee. Carla refused and said that she's not interested, and she said, in being around those kind of I had commented earlier on that Zia supported herself and her family as a subway musician at the time. When I insisted she argued that it might be dangerous for her job if she's seen sharing a table with someone who is poor. As in this previous example, appearing to be of a privileged social class is more important than being a woman than me. Circuits of exchange may get interrupted when individuals of different classes enter in contact in the ambient. As other research suggests, these prejudices are not exclusive to the ambient. Um, at a conversation group for women who love women organized by an organization called Musas de Metal, um, 14 participants took part in a discussion on love and companionship. In one of the conversations, uh, facilitators asked participants, what is important in a couple? Interestingly, during a part of the conversation, the women present, pre present suggested that they preferred to be with a woman of the same social class. Sandra, who was sitting by the window, warned us that she did not want to generalize, but similar status was important to her. She talked of how she did not understand her ex-girlfriend because she did not want to study to get a better job. The facilitator added that in heterosexual couples, you can observe more often a situation where the man has a university degree and the wife has not finished high school. In her opinion, this is rarely the case between them. Soon the room was filled with voices asserting that social class influences what people do and where they go. Sandra, for example, suggested that if she goes to the museum with her partner, she wants her to enjoy her time as well. If she is from a working class background, her partner is feeling out of place in the same way she could experience herself in a banda popular music concert. Not all women express prejudice as openly as Carla did in a previous example in this section, or Sandra Lima. Uh, however, they all highlight that for many women, being the ambiente does not mean forming part of the same community. Uh, ultimately, <coughs> socioeconomic exclusions commodification or classes attitudes work in three different ways um, in El Ambiente. It excludes women from participation in spaces. It excludes women from potential friendships, romantic and or er erotic relations. And it prevents individuals from learning the common grammar that circulates in the network of the Ambiente, restricting access to a common understanding of particular sexual identities, sexual or emotional practices in the Ambiente. I have discussed El Ambiente as a space that emerges through a set of relations, be it sexual, affective, ideological, or material, that take place between participants. While at first sight, El Ambiente seems to operate around the idea of shared erotic practices, preferences, or identities, other factors such as class must be considered. Middle class women had easier access to El Ambiente for material reasons, and they also were more included through the circuits form friendship, love, and eroticism. Seen as a privileged milieu, there is a certain prestige in claim, claiming alliance to El Ambiente. But as Brown has formulated in relation to recent queer theorizing, the contradictions and complexities of being both normal and dissident 
have yet to be fully recognized. And that's unfortunate. So, there will be a publication of uh, this presentation, but the longer version where I talk also about cosmopolitan identification in the, uh, I think it's coming up in the November, December issue of the uh, NWSA journal. the other side of the coin. Um, I'm going to be talking about rural, rural sexuality in Mexico and basically going to be talking about female masculinity. Um, the, uh, what I presented today is a fragment uh, What I'm presenting today is a fragment of an article that, that I've been working with, co-authoring with a friend of mine, with a, with a colleague. Margaret Sarubo. And it is based on uh, five years field work in different areas of the state of Morelos that I'm going to show a map later on. And working about not only men, but also women, um, what I consider gender intermediate figures in rural Mexico. So, but before, um, before I begin my share of the presentation, I would like to start with a brief anecdote. It was my second year of field work in Ixtilco El Grande a town located in central rural Mexico. One of my colleagues and I, we were doing some interviews, and we saw this man waiting for us to finish, to finish. He looked very interested. This is, this is him. He looked very interested in whatever we were doing. When we finally finished, he, we lost sight of him. A few minutes passed, and we heard a deep voice saying hi. We shook hands, we introduced ourselves. Very important, we didn't say your name. But also, we, we took for granted that the man that was in front of us was another campesino, another farmer from the town of Ixtilco. He was wearing a typical campesino outfit, boots, the white sombrero, typical from the region, chinos, and a belt embroidered in white. At that point, little we knew about him. By, talking, by taking his gender for granted, we talked with him about cattle and land. Mm -hmm. while, we were, while we were talking, he just smiled and looked at us with a lot of curiosity. When this interaction was happening, we heard a man shouting from the other side of the road as a way of hello, hey, Lupe. And the man that was in front of us responded that greeting. Suddenly, we realized that the man who had, we had in front, it wasn't a man, it was a woman. And that it was a woman that we've been here for almost two years, the only woman who earned land, who had land in Steve. So she just said, I think I don't know your names. I'm Guadalupe. Nice to meet you. From this day on, a different world was open to us in Ixtipo. We entered the non-traditional spheres in town. We were more than welcome in the gay restaurant um, store outside that was located in the, store, in, in the middle of the town. Um, in the middle of the town. Um, it, it was right there in the middle of the town. We got to know everybody that was a gender intermediate figure and the social relationship and interactions at Fort Park of it. Sadly, Lupe was murdered two years ago on this date, November 2nd. It was not perceived as a hate crime. A lot of things got intertwined, intertwined in her assassination, politics, rumors, and power. People in the town, and it's, and it's the towns nearby, experienced Lupe's murder as if another campesino was murdered, not a woman. They say that women in that region don't get murdered, only men. Lupe was buried as a man. The church referred to Lupe as a woman, while the town political organization referred to Lupe as a man, but sometimes as a woman. Look, Lupe was both a woman and man. Lupe's partner is seen and accepted as a widow, Lupe's widow. The majority of the time when we think about, um, about Mexican rural sexuality, we think we link it to religion. Most of the time, heterosexuality conservative views, and let's not forget machismo. Yes, all of this forms parts of, an as form parts of an aspect of rural sexuality in Mexico. But these characteristics are also present at the urban spheres in every social economic strata. Outside of the different investigations, documentaries, and press coverage, of, and press coverage of, that has focused on mushes in Cuchitan, Oaxaca, men that have, raped, that have been raised as women and are considered a different gender by themselves. There, are not, there has not been much, there has not been much problematization re 
regarding non-heterosexual practices and our identities in rural countries. I want to make a parenthesis here, purposely in this presentation. I am not going to use the sexual identities that are present in urban areas. The reason for that is because in several fieldwork experiences that I've been, that I've been, that I've been, um, that I've done in several parts of Mexico, when I ask people about their sexual identity, the majority of them, they don't know what I'm talking about. Most of the time, I have to define what I mean when I ask about heterosexuality, homosexuality, and bisexuality. By this, I'm not saying that sexual practices in rural Mexico do not have any sexual identities. Um, they do, but they are linked to a gender, to a gender image that sometimes it can be linked to a sexual practice, but not necessarily. The line between gender, sexual practice, and identity is extremely thin, and sometimes this line cannot be even seen. A brief example of this is well, a brief example of this um, that will help us clarify. I hope is when we are in a couple, is when there is a couple that is sharing the same gender. It's socially expected that one of them will perform the masculine role. This person will be a woman man, uh, and, and the other the feminine role, a man and woman. Two men or two women could never be together. Only in a only a woman man. In a case of, a, of two women, only a woman man can be with a woman woman, and in the, the, the case of two men together, only a man woman can be with a man man. Woman men and men women are not new in Mexico. Are, are not new in Mexico. They have been present in our history, and they have been formed. And they have been formed part of the important historical moment in Mexico. As we can see in Gabriela's Gabriela's kind of article, Amelio Robles an old soldier war, photography and masculinity in the Mexican Revolution. Kind of talks about Colonel Amelio Robles, who was born a woman in a small town in the state of Guerrero in 1889. She learned from an early stage in her life to use guns, tame horses, and to fight. All of these activities were considered to be male attributes. The masculinity embodied by Amelia Robles and accepted by her contemporaries, contemporaries was a performance orchestrated through poses and bodily movement, facial gestures, as well chosen wardrobe, and a very skilled manipulation of visual culture via studio photography, which was within the reach of anybody at the beginning of the 20th century who wanted to make an impression of a desirable body image. We can see Amelia Robles is right there in the middle between the guy who's sitting down and the one with the, who's standing up, right there in the middle, the shortest one of them. has uncovered not frontal assaults on the normative gender order, but sources of disturbance, and in the case of Amelia Robles, an ongoing mobilization to continue to contain it. While Robles succeeded in being recognized as a male veteran of the revolution, she didn't return to her village, to her home village after the revolution, to avoid harassment. Still, two men subsequently assaulted her at some point with the goal of discovering her body secrets, and she killed both of them. She, she was charged, and as an additional accumulation, was put in a woman's prison. She was a subject of jokes, even on the part of men, who were her protectors, her commanders in arms. When she died, she was buried in woman's clothing, apparently at her own, at her own request. Her, tombs, her tombstone is dedicated to a feminine Coronel Zapatista, Amelia Robles, not Amelia Robles, the coroner. As Cano reminds us, the revolution strengthened gender ideology with roots in the nationalist narrative of the 19th century and the identity, and identity uh, that identity masculinity, uh, sorry, the century, that identified masculinity with courage and personal strength and with patriotism and revolutionary ideology. Here we can see two women who were, who were part of the Mexican Revolution. They're, they were not even seen as soldiers. They were soldaderas. The one used to be part of the um, company of soldiers, not like a mayor of this, who was a colonel, who, who was part of the army. With the passage of time, the image of the courageous revolutionary converted itself into the iconic image of post-revolutionary nationalist discourse. Kano's narrative suggests that one dimension of the strengthening, 
ethnic and biological intensity of gender ideology during and after a revolution may be maybe the intensity of the social bonds that the revolution may foster. She tells us about the, she tells us that a Mendoza story is recognized by the Estero Guerrero as a male revolutionary hero, but a media Rojas has been seen in national history as an emblem of the contribution made by women in the Mexican Revolution. There is even a statue of her at a museum opened by the Secretary for Women opened by the Secretary for Women in the State of Guerrero, not for him. All of this erases her transgender status from social memory. She has been claimed as part of an effort to recognize their contributions of women in all aspects of Mexican history and life. But with the underlying assumption that men and women are fixed at their ways, and thus this recognition comes at the cost of denying the plasticity of gender and the presence of marginal desires. Ixtlipo el Grande is located in the state of Morelos, the place where the Mexican Revolution started and where the General Emiliano Zapata, this is Morelos, this is the state of Morelos, and I'll be talking um, right in the very end in a town called Azochapan, there's where Ixtlipo el Grande is located, in the border of the state of Puebla. Okay. So Ixtlipo el uh, Grande is located in the state of Morelos, the place where the Mexican Revolution started and where the General Emiliano Zapata, this is Ruta 2010. That means that it was the route that a lot, because we're going to come into the bicentenario of the Mexican Revolution and independence. So there's signs all like this during all the road and what's called Ruta Zapata, where the revolution took place. So this is just outside of This is Emiliano Zapata. So the Morelos is the place where the Mexican Revolution started and when the general in Emiliano Zapata, one of the main icons and fighters of the Mexican of the Revolution, was born and raised. Being Morelos, the land of Zapata, where men are expected to be the machos of the machos, just as Zapata, and where the, the land still holds the ideals of the revolution, is where Guadalupe used to live. As I mentioned before, Lupe was the only woman who owned land without being a woman. This is some images of some women men um, in town. A lot of women, mostly in this time where this photo was taken, that was in the 1940s, a lot of women were not allowed to drink, but women men were allowed to drink. And as you can see, we can portray, they can, they're reaffirming their masculinity through alcohol. This is the road to going to Ixtipo Grande. As you can see, there is not much around there. This is the entrance into Ixtipo Grande. This is the entrance into Ixtipo Grande. And this is an assembly of all the farmers. There's no woman there. Only Dolores was the only woman, but she was a woman. So, as I mentioned before, Lupe was the only woman who owned land without being a widow. She had bought her own land, as any other man in town. She was one more of the hidatarios, village property owners, a campesino, a ganadero, cattle rancher, a cañero, a sugar cane grower, and the head of her household. She was, this is, constituted as a man through her highly skilled assumptions of roles in the sexual division of labor and power that are exclusively assigned to men. As we discovered, however, she, la she lacked the masculine privilege to, of transferring property automatically to her dependents, in this case, her widow. That was the only aspect that the town did not give Lupe the right to see, to be seen as one more of the men of his people. The woman, as you can see, there is, um, there is Lupe, next to her is her widow. The two other women, they're sisters of her. Um, Dolores used to, you know, Lupe used to live with them. Um, she used to be the household, the man of the house, and she used to work for them. And like in any other Mexican household in rural Mexico, she used to do the whole farming and everything, and the woman used to help her. Um, Judith Halberstam, in both female masculinity and in queer time and place, offers several crucial lenses that have helped us to think about Lupe, to think about Lupe's life and death, and are telling of her story. 
first as a narrative contribution to a queer archive or rural life, whose particular forms of embodiment and social inscriptions and of courage, terror, and tenderness are largely unimaginated in our urban, first and third world understanding of queer lives. Have we encountered here one of Judith Halberstam's sense of queer time, a time out of joint? Because Lupe's life breaks a familiar narrative of sequence that is supposed to order it. Hers was not the standard pattern of life seen Kinsey, girl of adolescence and courtship in the village followed by engagement, coupling with, with or without marriage, and finally motherhood, the mark for women's social adulthood. Here's a story written over several times in fragments of simulated or dissimulated past suddenly emerged to interrupt today's narrative, throwing it out of joint. She describes her life as a girl, emphasizing her physical appearance, the markers of her femininity, long and thin, long black hair and her clothing, her skirts and dresses. When we prompt her, she completes the narrative of her femininity with boyfriends, three of them to be exact, all vague relationships that happen elsewhere and sometimes, who knows, everything is really relative. Um, once we asked her why she never get married, her reaction was immediately, why would I want a pendejo, an asshole in my life? She repeated discarding the three boyfriends from the same reason. She didn't want to support any of the pendejos. While Lupe is indeed a master of ambiguity and disguise, her inventiveness has been called out by the need to create a narrative for which there are not available cultural templates. Here is what a Lupe, a being um, fulfilling one of the roles of, of man, is becoming a godfather. So this is one of his god kids. Um, when we ask Lupe, when she first used a hand, when, 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 when she used her hands, she told us, one day her grandmother just told me that women shouldn't, shouldn't wear, wear skirts or working in the land. You had better put on pants. And so for the first time during the parade that is performed to celebrate the Mexican Revolution and independence um, on September 16th, Guadalupe publicly wore pants. She went to the nearest market town and bought herself a pair green shirt, her white hat, and some minor boots. Um, on the same day, she went to a hairdresser and had her and had her long hair, her long black hair cut, leaving her with a buzz cut. Sometimes Lupe described her transformation more poetically. One day I was I was plowing the land and a strong wind passed through my legs and blew away my skirt and my hair. So far, the wind carried off her familiar and that never and that one's never returned. The ambiguity that Lupe created with time overlaps with the ambiguity that she creates with a physical image. We might say that Lupe developed a great skill in which ambiguity and camouflage were her specialty. This is Lupe. Um, she was around 16 years old. We never knew at what age was she stopped using the skirt and she started using skirts and cut her hair. Um, she's, a, she's the one standing uh, riding the horse and with the hat, she's using the whole attributes of the masculine, masculine, of a man of the revolution, as we saw like, further up in of Zapata. Guadalupe identified her, herself as a woman, as a woman, and referred to herself as Guadalupe, not as Lupi, the masculine form. But in her social and familiar environment, she behaved and moved as a man. In fact, since her death, her ghost appears in the house. It is grunting, whistling, and coughing, just like a man. When Guadalupe walked through a town or through the campo, almost always the other men talked to her, referring to her as Lupi. You could tell by the way they spoke with her with and related to her through their tone of voice, voice, jokes, and whistles, that she was considered one of them. Like them, Lupi emitted sharp whistles in public, spit on the street and heat as we walked, smoked and drank outside of the house, jumped into trucks full of men, and sat herself with them on the sidewalk. When we started to write about Lupe, we, did, we didn't set out to write the story of her death, but of her life. And we did not think we were writing the story of a passing woman. Oddly, it was only upon her death that we learned that her efforts to change her official gender 
vote a recently reissued birth certificate from 1990 and her voting credential dated in the, in the year 1991, as we can see here, indicated sex, man, sexo, hombre. There is no posthumous written archive of Luca's death or life, except the one we're creating. Like many deaths in rural and urban Mexico, it has been rarely registered. There, has, there was an autopsy where results officially identified her, her gender as female. This created a problem because the gender that was registered at her certificate of death did not match her official birth certificate and her ID. Lupe was born a woman, lived and died as a man, but her life did not coincide with her legal death document, legal, legal death document. The funeral eulogy, eulogy announced that this was time to forgive and forget, both the crime and its victims, the return to normal, the research, the research, the acceptability <coughs> of a violent, of a violent masculinity, or it may simulate the stability, the stabilizing counterpart. Using poverty stamp, we can suggest that in the case of Lupe, or Lupi, the attempt to contain the obviously potent masculinity that Lupe crafted for himself, despite overwhelming odd, odds, asserted itself unexcusable as a cultural imperative. Exiliquenses were guided not to ask why or how he or she was murdered in the middle of the day, close to time and in close to town in a site of well transverse field and path in several houses within witnesses or by home. With the two cases presented here, a mayor Lawrence and Guadalupe or Lupin, we perceive the plasticity of gender in rural contact. At the beginning, I mentioned the cases of the Mushes in Oaxaca. They are the ones that have more that have had a more public life outside of Cuchitán, outside of Cuchitán, Oaxaca, and even Mexico. But, of, but the vast majority of investigations and public eyes have masked the case, have, have, have masked the case of the induced also from Pachitán, women that have been raised as men, as the Mushes. Um, they form part, they, they form a part, they form part of a separate gender structure. The Mushes are the only instances that the, instances that the urban LGBTQ movement in Mexico has used and embraced as an icon of non-urban sexuality. The Mushes in use figures, figures as a mega robes and would be, um, are part of the multi-layer perceptions about genders that are found in rural Mexico. because this is not new. Like even of a mayor Robles, in use as the Mushes in Oaxaca, they have been raised for a lot of years, like for, for many, many years. As the use has been raised as men, they're the only ones who can go fishing a lot that, that they are the only women born men, well, born women, um, who can actually go fishing, do a man's work. And also 
in different areas of Guerrero and in the part of the coast, there are a lot of women who are considered men, too, and a lot of men who are considered women. And in north of Mexico, we have the same scenario. The only, that's why I wanted to mention the Mushes, because there's the only one, the only image who has visibility in, in the majority of the LGBT movement in Mexico and outside of Mexico. I hope I responded to your question. I answered your question. Heterosexuality means they don't know it. What homosexuality means they don't know it. Neither they're not related at all with the urban context of the ambient or LGBTQ identities. No, they're not. They're completely. They create their own identities. They're not related to an ambient. They created, they referred to Guadalupe as a man woman, a, a person who has both. Then in the case of Oaxaca, we have the Mushes that are men that are men raised as women, and the Ingus that, um, that are men, that are women who are raised as women. And then if we go around um, asking, they have their own gender, their own sexual identities. You know, we have, I could mention so many right now. Um, they, that they just create at the like, First of the moment, yeah. yeah, but they're not they're not linked with any of the labels that we have established that we know. Do you have any idea of how the kind of label that they develop? Maybe like if you tell them also this kind of a relationship. What could be the relationship? The relationship, well. The, 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 the one that I found that was more that was more specific and most commonly used all around Mexico was this one the gender the like the gender the gender intermediate figure as men woman woman man because the other one it changed for example some woman who had um, who had who was a man woman um, which you, you could call it the maniflora um, or piechueco. Um, different, like there are multiples, and like really didn't, didn't, was not that one or the other. Like they could be completely parallel; they could never connect, you know. And they could exist by them by themselves. Like even like Dolores, Lupe, she always identified herself as a woman. She never said that I'm a, a woman man. Never, never. Other people did, you know, and. They always said, well, you know, they can say whatever they want with me. You know? But she recreated all of the gender patterns of a man. And she had her, she had her partner. Her, she was socially accepted as her widow. That that was all the time covering covering Lupe all the time because what happened when I we just we found out that she has changed her IDs and her birth certificate once she was already dead and I asked her widow and she said well you know they just assume that Lupe was a man because she was wearing like pants and a hat and she looked as a man but. And I think, um, talking, going back to different talks that we had, is that she wanted to reassure, she wanted to make sure that the land that she had, the cattle that she had, was hers, and that could, she could pass it to, to
to her will, and she could pass it to her sister. You know, and because a woman cannot pass land because of the whole um, land reform that we have in Mexico. A woman cannot own land only if she's a widow. And Dolores you know, Lupe was the only person that could really, was the only woman in town and in that region that could own property by her own name. And she didn't want that, that get lost. So it was, it was that this part of ambiguity that Lupe played. She identified as a woman, as a woman, woman. Okay. And so how does like the initiation kind of courtship happen in those kind of relationships? There's just this understanding of gender is ambiguous and like the it's a more of a woman's good idea of that female. That just how, how does that even happen in terms of a small town like that? It was men who was courtship of a woman. And that was that was it. And it was they started they did the whole courtship. They and as we can see in several photos in the past, you know, um, Lupe started dressing as a man from an early age. And she earned land, she worked the land from a really, really very early age. So it was a man, Christian, a woman. And we can see it, it's, this is not like the specific case, as we can see in Amelio Robles. She, he also had uh, a wife. And it was okay. Even if he stated that he, that his wife, and, the, and him, they had kids together. Who knows how that happened? Who like it was never like a million. It was in Abelas kind of kind of article. She didn't go in depth in that, but like even that a million Robles was a father. And in the cases of the induced in Oaxaca, they are also a man courtship another woman. They are expected to get married to with a woman. And the mushes also they're expected to get married with a man. And kind of follow up with that. How do you see that this changing? Like where there's, I know that there's a very different uh, definition of this kind of environment, but how do you think that maybe the outward expression of like the concept of really dressing like a man, does that diminish with the increased security and I guess of like this group formation within the urban setting? Or is that, like I'm wondering if this is just a way of projecting this male identity is, I don't know, like, trying to fit into this little of the world setting, whereas if there was a setting for more of a hours away from Mexico City, yeah. so it, it's not very far, but in that short uh, distance, the identities available change. And for example, in the 22 people that I interviewed, um, there was a woman who said that she used to pass as a man um, about five or six years before the interview, but her inter interpretation of it is like, I, I used to pass as a man in my neighborhood, and she, uh, actually there were two. Um, she had girlfriends, but in this case, like passing as a man and the woman that she was with, not having, uh, not knowing that she was uh, a biological woman. But then as uh, years went by, she met um, some people connected to the ambiente who actually um, identified as lesbians. So um, she decided at some point to uh, take a lesbian identity stopped identifying as a man. But that was also because in that context you have that identity available, uh, which is not really the case uh, of this village, even if you're not. Well, that's actually exactly my question though, is that like in the urban context, how it affected her own like, perception of herself and like her outward expression of that. So it's obviously if you have like the a lot of farming and the outdoor work and so it kind of completed that. I'm wondering if you're saying where Since um, the moment
most visible spaces of the ambiente are usually middle class oriented. Um, it's actually interesting to see that individuals who are um, kind of accepted or not independently of their sexual identity would be uh, often based on class attributes. So if someone appears to be of the middle classes, uh, independently of their sexual identity, they will be accepted in the ambiente. Um, if they don't seem to be middle class, even if they identify as, as a lesbian, they might be looked at like, what is this person doing? Um, so the appearance in general would be like kind of um, a middle class appearance. So uh, um, kind of having enough money to buy a particular set of clothes. Um, and there's someone even who would be seen as more feminine and other ones as more masculine. But you don't have this same situation where all women have particular kind of jobs, although yes, there's, there's trends, um, as in the village, or all men have a particular kind of jobs, although there are trends, like so. Not all women, uh, all men work in agriculture, for example, in Mexico City, like you have um, a very different kind of working situation. So in that sense, um, the way to identify second generation migrants would still like the this concept of female masculinity is still very embedded in the culture. You know, it's still they go a lot to the villages, they go back and forth to visit their families. So they have in a way to they're kind of like playing with the urban and the rural a little bit. You know, they don't cut their hair they don't cut their hair as bus cuts. You know, they have it they wear all the time ponytails and ponytails or they join soccer clubs for the women. And then they're very they're most morally feminine, and they like fulfill roles, gender roles, uh, specific like, you know, like that they're expected for people, like hairdressing and things like that. But it's very like both contexts are very different, rural and urban, and the social economic levels that make a huge difference. And this whole back and forth of rural communities too. Yeah. To, as, to see just in case it's like they will respond outside of the heterosexual, non -heter like heterosexual, homosexual, or bisexual label. They don't you know, like they don't they look possible because they don't they don't know what trans is. So they don't even consider themselves as trans. Um, yeah, Spanish ambiente means like an environment. So if you say um, ambiente, like it, it would, people in general like would interpret it as something related to the environment, but uh, people who go to those spaces, if you say um, this is a space of an ambiente, then they will know exactly what you're referring to. So it's, it's often um, someone who has 
been going to Labiente for about 25 years, was telling me that it used to be a code word um, to keep a certain level of secrecy or protection. So um, if you're in front of other people, you would say, oh, yes, tonight we're going to this um, bar de Ambiente. And other people wouldn't know what they thought, what, what um, was talked about. So she was telling me that um, it was used forbidden to discriminate against uh, race, gender, or religion, and, uh, about 10 terms, and among them, uh, they cite preference, but they don't say sexual preference, so that has been a little <coughs> bit of a debate, but after that, in an anti-discrimination federal law, then they spelled out um, that it's forbidden to discriminate against sexual preference. Um, um, and then, if you look at Mexico City, specifically as uh, a case, um, there has been different kinds of efforts. So in 2005, you had a same-sex union law uh, that passed called uh, Sociedades de Convivencia. Um, so people um, now use this law for civil unions. Um, and there has been also different programs. So about, I think it was in 2007 that the city Went, underwent a certification uh, to become a queer-friendly city. So there's a couple of cities in the world, New York, uh, world like New York City is one of them, um, Amsterdam, and I don't remember, which others that have undergone a certification, and then they basically receive a certificate that says, yes, we're city is square, and they basically receive a certificate that says, yes, we're city is square-friendly. And you have uh, people from the movement and the committee for that, you have people who uh, were part of the of, of businesses like restaurants, um, bars, and so on, um, and are, of course, policy makers. So this happened, but at the same time, when you talk with people, um, I was just in Mexico City, actually, um, last, last week. Um, like, people say that, yes, this is true, but um, the same kind of policies that, or, uh, that used to happen uh, 10 years ago are still happening. So, uh, they close a lot of bars or restaurants, the ambiente, um, and really often they say that, uh, oh, it's because this building is not really following the norms of the city, but um, sometimes it's like to put pressure and open and contain particular um, kind of parts to only like one part of the city. So it's, it's there, there are like changes in policy, but at the same time when talking because of the context, there, there, there are mixed feelings, right? Like they're like, yes, we're being um, um, respected in one way because there are changes, but in another way, uh, you know, there's still a lot of um, homophobic crimes and so on. And, and in the case of Morelos, it's, it's different, actually. Yeah. I don't know. Well, they are fighting, like, for the, for the Slater Convivencia like for the last, since it passed in Mexico City, like they've been passing, they've been fighting for to obtain it, and there's something up, because we're so close to Mexico City, as we can see, it's just an hour and a half away from it. So we really, we're kind of like back and forth a lot. So there's a lot of the influence on the legal aspect of, um, <coughs> for protection about sexual diversity. And even, like they, they've been, they've been a lot of NGOs working on sexual diversity in Mexico, you know, in Guernavaca, in basically in Guernavaca, that's the capital of the state of Morelos. And that has been kind of like giving an umbrella to the rest, to the rest of the state, you know, to, to protect, um, that way they're not hate crimes, that way they're not aggression for, for, for the LGBT 
LGBT community of Cuernavaca and equality, and as the other main city that there is in, in, in Morelos, and trying to protect um, also that way even people who don't identify themselves inside the LGBT community or as a sexual uh, or being part of a non-heterosexual community. There, there's a laws of different NGOs that have been trying to, um, to take this laws in action to protect sexual diversity. I'm not saying like that um, some need to be cut or not, like in, in official discourses, like in front of the government, it's really often the LGBTQ agenda that predominates. Um, but at the same time, there is knowledge of other identities as um, through the mushes that Mazzino was men mentioning. Um, so that there is knowledge that there's other identities, and, and, and there are um, these problems in, uh, when you try to which identities are going to be the ones that are placed at the predominant religion uh, in the country. And, and, and the, the church, uh, yes, has had, it can be identified as one of the forces that plays into the different gender and sexuality discourses that are available. But aligned with the church, we have also uh, many right-wing organizations that are also very strong. And they are often called to give their opinion on um, different debates to gender and sexuality in the country uh, on TV, in the newspaper. Uh, so the, the Catholic Church speaks on uh, these different issues, like, uh, for example, when, there's a, when there was uh, the civil union law that was going to pass, you, you had a strong opinion of the Catholic Church, but also the right wing movements and that are um, connected with um, 
companies that have a lot of money in Mexico. So that's also an important force in the country that defines the urban map, I would say, or the, the pub, or what's in the public place uh, in Mexico in terms of discourses available in gender and sexuality. Other questions? Well, thank you very much. <laughs>